I want to talk to you this morning about when I am anxious. Anxiety has become the new depression of this generation that we're living in. As a matter of fact, Donald Saxby, who is a clinical psychologist at the University of Southern California, wrote a piece in December of this past year, just before Christmas, and he said that I worry for some people that anxiety has become an identity marker that makes people feel special and unique. He said that's a big problem because this modern idea of anxiety has given people a fixed mindset. Listen to that. A fixed mindset that tells them who they are and who they will be in the future. Prozac has been replaced by Xanax because of people, especially our young people, our teenagers and our college students, feeling anxious about all of life. There are famous movie stars that I've read about this week. There are famous athletes that I've read about this week. There are famous politicians that I've read about, all of them claiming to live lives of of extreme anxiety. If I were to start calling their names, you would recognize their names because some of them are actually billionaires. Some of them, all of these that I would call to you are considered uber successful in their careers. One actress who is, if I was to call her name, she says, I am probably 10 steps ahead of everybody else when it comes to the issue of anxiety. I've been anxious since I was 13 years old, and I'm constantly worried about what people think about me, and I, I hurt over every criticism that comes my way. As I looked at this, and then I looked at some stats for TikTok and some stats for some of the other apps that our students lead, use, the number one issue on those platforms, on social media platforms, is the issue of anxiety. And so I don't think Saxby, the psychologist that I just quoted, is off base when he said it has become a fixed mindset when it comes especially to our young people. I thought about those words of George Mueller that, and George Mueller, in case some of you have forgotten or you don't know, George Mueller was the man who ran an orphanage in Britain during the 1800s by faith and never publicized his needs and taught us so much about faith. But Mueller wrote these words. He said, the beginning of anxiety is the end of faith. The beginning of anxiety is the end of faith. And the beginning of true faith is the end of anxiety. The beginning of true faith is the ending of of anxiety. So would you stand with me? And you know this passage. I fear that perhaps you might be tempted not to pay as close attention to the message because this passage is so familiar to so many of us. It's the 23rd Psalm. So I'm asking you to diligently give heed to the word of the Lord. I don't say this often, but when I do, it's not to power up or to amp up, but it's to ask you, as we should every week, Listen carefully to the word of the Lord because I believe that he's here, present and real to speak to us, each of us, and those online as well this morning. So read this aloud with me, and if you're watching online, you can read it aloud with us as well. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Can we give the Lord a hand of praise for that? I mean, just, wow. Now, though you're familiar with it, how many of you would lift your hand and say, Pastor, that just did something for me 
to read that out loud. Can I see your hand? It just, and don't lift it unless you, it did some, remember last week's, one of the last week's points was every day read scripture aloud to yourself for faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of the Lord. Father, we submit ourselves to your word this morning. And once again, I ask you to anoint me to speak your word, your message to this congregation and to those that are online. I believe that this is a timely word, but I believe it's also a timeless word, Lord. I ask you, Lord, to help us to focus and when we check out, Lord, to immediately check back in so that we hear carefully what you have to say to us today, that we might be ambassadors of faith in this world we live in. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. God bless you. You can be seated. There's seven areas of life or spheres of life that all of us need victory in. Number one is worry. There's a lot of worry that's going on in our world today. There's more to worry about today than there's ever been to worry about. Whether it's about nuclear war, whether it's about diseases like COVID recurring again, there's more hurry in our world than we've ever experienced before. Because speed creates anxiety. The faster you live, the higher pace of living, the more that you're involved in, the more anxiety that that creates in our lives. Crowd noise. It's been shown study after study that especially unharmonious noises, noises that are just like traffic noise or factory noise or aircraft noise that we're surrounded with here in the metro area constantly. You wake up at night and you hear the interstate, you hear the, the airplanes, you hear traffic on the river, you just hear noise all the time. And study after study is showing that it is increasing stress in lives. As a matter of fact, in Europe it has become so severe that it's become a health crisis that has been diminishing the lifespans of people. Making decisions has become a stressful thing because there's so many choices in life. I went into the grocery store for Becky this week I walked over to the cereal aisle. I cannot believe there are more cereals than there used to be just a few years ago. I went to the candy aisle. There's more. I just look and there's so many choices. There used to be one choice in my household for toothpaste, Crest toothpaste. Everybody wants their own brand of toothpaste right now. And there's all kinds of flavors of toothpaste and all kinds of toothpaste that's supposed to keep your teeth from falling out. Two words, blood, brush, floss, third word, less sugar. Okay, you didn't, you didn't cost you anything. But so many choices for jelly, for jam, for whatever it is in life. Our privacy, we're losing our privacy to government. We're losing our privacy to corporations. We don't realize how much privacy we're giving up when it comes to social media. When I read the news on my iPad, I, I recognize that now that all of my news feeds are giving me according to what they think I want to read, an algorithm of news. And so I found myself going back to an old-fashioned thing. How many of you remember something called a newspaper? It's nice. I just like it again. I like holding it again. And in the wintertime, it makes a good fire starter in your fireplace, you know? In the old days, it made a good liner for your trash can if you grew up in my home. But there's this great loss of privacy, and people feel stressed because there's ads on their phones, there's ads on their devices. If you have a smart TV, there's ads on your devices, and they're all tailored to get your, your attention to make a decision they want you to make rather than a decision you would make. Mission has become a huge stress area. There used to be a time in America when everybody agreed with me when I said Jesus is Lord. Whether or not they lived for him or not, they believed that Jesus was Lord. Everybody agreed with me when I said Jesus was the Son of God. Whether or not they lived for him, it didn't matter. Everybody agreed that if you died in faith, you were going to heaven. If you died rejecting Christ, you would go to hell. That used to be just the standard of what people believed. We were taught when I was in school, America was, if you remember this, was the great melting pot. 
We're not a melting pot anymore. We're a stew pot. We've got potatoes and carrots and chunks of onion and chunks of garlic because we live in such a pluralistic society where everybody can be right about what they believe. And so we clump together and nobody agrees on anything anymore. Families are dividing over politics. Families are dividing over religion. There are arguments. There are time bombs in every social situation, whether it's a small group, a corporation, your job, the line you work on, or even in a church, or even in your marriage or your family, if you're not careful. And then, of course, there's the future. Such great, great fear of the future and what's going to happen. Doomsday scenarios, according to Atlantic Magazine, have come up with all kinds of ways that the world is going to end. There is a third of our society that fears a societal collapse. We saw something close to that during COVID, didn't we? There's another third of our society that fears that it's going to be disease, another un undiagnosed disease. There's another significant part of our society, 15% are afraid of a new world war or of a nuclear war that's going to be happening. And 43% of Americans, 43% of Americans have prepped for a doomsday scenario. In other words, they have guns, they have ammunition, they have food, they have potable water stored in their basements or caches stored somewhere because they believe that the society that we know as the United States is going to collapse. And listen to this stat. 71% of Americans do not trust our government today. Friends, that is a staggering, staggering statistic. And that was according to a study done last year as well. Let me say it again and just mouth the words of Mueller. That the beginning of faith is the end of anxiety. Will you say that with me? The beginning of faith is the end of anxiety. Let's say it again. The beginning of faith is the end of anxiety. And when I speak of faith, I'm speaking about our faith in Jesus Christ. I'm not talking about an optimistic attitude. I'm not talking about everything's going to be okay. But I'm talking about a faith that God is in control. Can you say amen to that? We trust Jesus Christ. The Bible says in Proverbs 14 and verse 30 that a peaceful heart leads to a healthy body. In other words, if your heart is at peace, if your mind is at peace, you're going to naturally be healthier. Study after study has shown that. And so we want to look at Psalms 23 this morning. And I don't know if you remember, but a few years ago in our midweek services, I did a, an exposition verse by verse of Psalms 23. And I'm just going to try to bring all of that together into one message this morning. But if I understand this passage correctly, Psalms 23 and Proverbs 14, 30, it's not just what I eat that makes me healthy. It's whether or not my heart is at peace in Christ. And how many times does Jesus come along and say, fear not, fear not. But he says to us, peace be with you. Would you look at your neighbor this morning and say, peace be with you this morning. The peace of the Lord is ours. Now, let me ask a question. How many of you would like to live a healthier life? Can I see your hand? Yeah. How many of you would like to live a longer life? Can I see your hand? I used to say when I was real young, I don't care how long I live. I just want to live a healthy life and a full life. Now that I'm a papa, I kind of have a more concern about living a health. My prayer has changed. My prayer used to be, Lord, let me live to see the birth of my grandchildren. I don't know why it must be love, but now I find myself praying, Lord, let me live to see my grandchildren get married and start families of their own, and then I can die in peace. You see... God puts within us this will and this desire to live. And if we're healthy, we don't want to check out of life early. If we're healthy, we don't want to commit suicide. If we're healthy, we want to live and enjoy the families that God has given us. So how do we do that? Number one, 
According to Psalms 23, God will always provide whatever we need in life. God will always provide. People look to marriage. People look to careers. People look to money to provide what they need. But what I have discovered is there is lots of ways to lose. I've seen people lose their families. I've seen people lose their marriages. I've seen people lose their jobs. I've seen people lose their careers. Could I give you some pastoral advice this morning? Never put your trust. Never put your faith in what you can lose. Put your faith in that which you can't lose. You won't lose Jesus Christ because Jesus Christ won't lose you this morning. Hallelujah. Well, come on. Give him a hand of praise this morning. Never put your faith in what you can lose, but put your faith in him that will never leave you, never forsake you. Read Psalms 23 and verse 1 with me this morning. The Lord is my shepherd. I have all that I need. God gave me his son. We held that cup this morning. I did something I've never done in my life, but I was thinking about the message on Wednesday night on extravagant worship, and I just laid that bread next to my lips and kissed that bread as I thought about Mary bathing the feet of Jesus with her hair. And I said, Lord, I love you. I want to be extravagant in my worship because God was so extravagant with you and me. He gave his only begotten son to save you. If God gave gave you Jesus, won't he give you everything else that you need in this world to live? God will never forsake you. God will never abandon you. In John chapter 10 and verse 29, Jesus says, no one can snatch you from my father's hands. God is not going to lose you. Don't put your faith in that which you can lose. Put your faith in him and remind yourself that the Lord is your shepherd. Each one of these points I have tried to do for you so you could have a daily confession this week. So my suggestion to you tonight before you go to bed is just take a moment, lift your hands and worship and say, Lord, thank you for providing all that I need. And tomorrow morning when you get up, say thank you, Lord, because God will give me rest. God will give me rest. This week, I talked with a cashier, and I noticed she looked really exhausted. I had stopped in at the pharmacy to pick up something, and she looked really tired. And I looked, I said, are you okay? And she just looked, she said, I am so tired. I'm so exhausted. I haven't been able to sleep the last few nights. And she began to tell me about the anxiety, and she says, I've been drinking these Red Bull drinks to try and keep my energy up. And she just looked like death warmed over. And I looked at her, and I just... Gently, I said to her, look at me. Look at me. God loves you. And the Bible says to his beloved, he gives sleep. You cancel whatever else is going on today. You go home when you get off work, and you go to bed. We just finished a series on the Ten Commandments, and one of the big ten was that God gives us complete day every day to rest. My best requires that I rest. Let me say it again. My best requires that I rest. I love this young woman who is a cashier, but do you think she's given her employer the best because she's not rested? Do you think you're giving your marriage the best if you're not rested? Do you think you're giving to your children, your grandchildren the best if you're not rested? And I'm not just talking about physically rested, but spiritually at rest too. Read Psalms 23 and verse 2 with me this morning. He lets me rest. I really prefer the King James Version of that because it's more forceful. He makes me lie down. That Hebrew is, he puts me to bed. He puts me in a place where I rest. He lets me rest. Now, how many of you would agree with me that God is very, very smart? Hmm? God's pretty smart, right? I mean, just look around you at what all God has created. Don't look at how man has screwed it up, but look at what God did. He's smart. Why would he create you and me where one-third of our life is spent sleeping? Doesn't that seem like a total waste of time? I mean, with a robot, you can make a robot work 24 hours a day, seven days a week because it doesn't need rest. It just needs a little electricity, a little oil squirted here and there, and somebody smart enough to program it to do what it's supposed to do. 
but the height of God's creation that no robot will ever be able to replace. God says, I'm going to make you for one third of your life, you're going to need to rest. And one day of every seven days, I want you to stop working and I want you to worship. I want you to enjoy your family. I want you to have fun and I want you to rest. Does that sound smart to you? If you work on Wall Street, you don't think it sounds smart. If you're the head of Ford, you don't think it sounds smart. If you're the head of Chrysler, General Motors, you don't think it's smart because you want people working all the time, pumping up your bottom line. Friends, again, this week, somebody brought to me a a message about how successful Chick-fil-A is with their fast food restaurants, far outstripping everybody, every other fast food restaurant, and they're closed one day a week because the Kathy family chooses to honor God's word and give their family one day a week off. My best demands that I rest. Can we give him a hand of praise for that? He wants you to rest. Three areas where you need to rest. You need to rest physically. You need to refocus spiritually. That's what you do on Sundays. And then you need to recharge emotionally. Because All week long, as you're working, as you're doing life, you're depleting yourself spiritually, emotionally, and physically. And on that one day of rest, or when you take time to rest every day, you're recharging these three areas of your life that are so important. And thirdly, God's extravagance has filled my soul with beauty. God's extravagance with beauty. What all that he does It's intended to feed my soul. It's springtime in Michigan. And for those of you that don't live here, our winters, they're awful. I'll just confess it. That's not negative. That is scientific fact, according to the first epistle of Dennis. They suck. Their skies are gray. It's, It's nasty. But spring and summer here are fantastic. Even the weeds are pretty. I remember, remember Pastor A.J., I remember commenting to Pastor A.J., A.J., look how pretty the flowers on those weeds are. And A.J. looked at me and for, sounded so pastoral, so professorial, he looked at me and he says, that's just like sin, Pastor. It looks pretty, but it's still a weed. I said, A.J., get a life. So I got interested and started studying weeds and called my daddy at that time and found out about weeds actually serve a purpose. They bring up nutrients from the soil that healthy plants need. I had so much fun sharing that with AJ, and I didn't plan that at all, so I've got to be sure in sending this message this morning. But God creates a world of beauty. But when I look around me here, in our world that we live in, I drive the streets of Detroit, I drive the streets of Down River, I see clutter, I hear the noise. Sometimes I see the ugliness of, of burned out buildings, I see the gang tagging that's going on. I see all of this and I realize more than ever, I need to surround my life with more and more of God's creation and I need to surround my life with beauty. Again, let me ask you, God is smart, God is wise, Why did God make the world so beautiful? It could have been a barren planet. God is good enough and smart enough that he could have created us to live on a moon-like planet or on a Mars-like planet. And we just kind of, like the aliens that you see in the movies, we've all got big heads and, oh, the ugliest little bodies that you've ever seen in your life. And yet God created it and put us in a world of beauty. Why do so many people say this? And if you've said this before, lift your hand. I feel so close to God in nature. Haven't you said that? I feel so close to God in nature. Why? Because life began in a garden. God created us to live in a garden not in these megalopolis cities of high-rises and towers. The Bible says in Psalms 23, verse 2, he says, He lets me rest in green meadows, and he leads me beside peaceful streams. Isn't that a beautiful picture and a beautiful image there that God puts me in a place where I can rest surrounded by beauty? So just some things I'd like you to do this week. Go out. It's spring. You can do it. 
go outside daily, whether it's in your backyard or the courtyard of your apartments or whether you go for a walk in one of our metro parks or like Brownstown, we are blessed with so many community parks around here. Thank God for the recreation department here in Brownstown. Start your day with God. Did you know the first seven minutes of your day set the mood for your whole day? The first seven minutes of your day set your mood for the whole day. Occasionally, you'll hear me say this. I get up every morning. Tell them I'll call them right back, okay? I tell, tell, just, just get up, and I make a personal biblical scriptural confession every single day of my life. I get up in the morning. I twist my back, and then I just start confessing scripture because those first seven minutes set the mood of the day. And if you get up and you're grumpy and you're tired and you just, it's a bad day, you just feel like a jerk and then everybody else thinks you're a jerk because you're acting like a jerk. But if you open up your mouth and you say, Lord, I thank you, this is the day you've made, whether it's a gray winter day or a beautiful spring day. I thank you, Lord, that you gave your beloved rest last night. I thank you that I can do all things through Christ Jesus which strengthens me. Lord, I thank you that without faith it's impossible to please you, but he that comes to you must believe that you are and that you are a reward order of those who diligently seek you, Hebrews eleven six, 6, and faith is the end of anxiety. Somebody say amen this morning. Faith is the end of anxiety, and it doesn't matter what you have to face that day. Surround yourself with beauty and not just the practical. I'm a practical kind of guy. Becky has changed me on so many things. You know, I used to subscribe to the thing. My dad subscribed to it. You know, if it doesn't bear something that you can eat, why are you going to plant it and take care of it? But coming home and seeing tulips in our yard and daffodils in our yard and flowers blooming, I look around my house and there are paintings and pictures I would have never personally bought. But because I love my life, I said yes to Becky. And we're surrounded with beauty that makes our home a special place. Don't just fill your life with the practical, but surround yourself. Look at what the Bible says. Think, this is in Psalms, excuse me, from Philippians chapter 4 and verse 8. Think about the things that are good and worthy of praise. Think about the things that are true and honorable and right and pure and, say it again, Beautiful. say it again, Beautiful. and respect it, and respect it. Surround your life with that because you are not a machine. You were, look at me, don't miss this. You were created in the image of God and obviously God loves beauty or he wouldn't have created this incredible planet that we live on and made you like him so that you could be creators of beauty as well. Isn't that powerful? Let's read Psalms 23 and verse 3. He renews my strength. That's what beauty does. Whether it's music, whether it's art, whether it's family dinners, whatever it is, that's what beauty does for life. And then number four, God will guide me. God will guide me. I, I love to make decisions. But on vacation, I don't make any decisions. I make decisions every single day of my life. I don't mind me. I like the challenge of thinking them through. I like the challenge of mind mapping them, getting on paper, talking with people. I like that. But for me to rest, when we go on vacation, Becky and our children or whoever we're going on vacation with, they make all the decisions. If I have been with you on a vacation before, you know I don't make a decision. If you say we're going to hike in a mountain, we hike in a mountain. If you say we're going to town to eat, we go to town to eat. When I come home, I am so recharged because you've made all the decisions. But what I've discovered is this. Making decisions can breed anxiety. And the way that I overcome anxiety, the way I believe you should overcome anxiety, is to listen to what the book of James says. Don't say, tomorrow we're going to go do this and that. Tomorrow we're going to do this and that. But say, rather, if the Lord wills. But James says, if you lack wisdom, ask God to give you wisdom. I find myself every day, multiple times a day, going, God, I need wisdom to make this decision. Does that make, make sense to you? For the Bible says that God will guide me at the right time. 
Look at this verse, Psalms 23 and verse 3. He guides me along right paths, bringing honor to his name. Read it with me. He guides me along right paths, bringing honor to his name. Say, so, Pastor, how do you make a decision? Real quick, less than 30 seconds. I pray about it. I think about it. I wait on God about it. I read his word for direction about it. And then I put it in oil and I sit until I have a peace in my mind. When I ask the board to make a decision, I give them 30 days to pray about it, think about it, because I want them to know whether or not I'm doing the right thing or not. I've done that all my life. God is never in a hurry and neither should you be. Somebody should have said amen. God is never in a hurry, and neither should you be. Let me just give you three things from the book of John real quickly. God will guide me to receive truth. And those of you listening this morning, God will guide you to receive truth. You will accept that if you will yield to the Lord and say, Jesus, I really want to know what you want me to do in this situation. Jesus said in John 16, verse 12, there's so much more I want to tell you, but you can't bear it now. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. How many times people have said to me, said, Pastor, I've been to church all my life. I've heard that, but I never got it until today. Why? Because you weren't ready to receive it yet. And the quickest way to get ready is to slow down and trust God in the day-to-day decisions of life. Number two, God will guide my memory of the truth. How many of you would like to have a better memory this morning? Could I see your hands? Uh, Boy, those went up quick. If you want a better memory, look at this verse with me. The Holy Spirit will remind you of everything I have told you. The Holy Spirit is the best reminder-er that there exists. And he will remind you of the thing. If you walk in faith and say, Jesus, help me to remember all that you want me to do. And then finally, God will guide me to reproduce truth. In other words, my life will cause other people, will influence, all of us are influential, all of us have influence, and when other people see the love of God, the wisdom of God, the beauty of God, the grace of God, the patience of God, the power of God, the truth of God, when they see God's grace and mercy manifested in us, they want what we have, and God begins to reproduce his truth in other people's lives. Can we give him a hand of praise for that? I mean, that is just powerful. The Spirit will take what I have to say, that's the Bible, and will tell it to you. The number five Stay close to God in your darkest valleys. Stay close to God. All of us go through times of loss. All of us go through times of fear. All of us go through times of grief. But look at me. Grief is good. Fear is bad. Grief is good. You might want to write that down. Grief is good. Fear is bad. Grief is how God helps me to handle the transitions of life. The death of a son or a daughter, the death of a spouse or a parent, the loss of a marriage, any of these things, the loss of a job. Grief is how we get through. We do not grieve the way the world grieves. We grieve with hope because we know that God is in control. Do you think Joseph grieved when he was sold into slavery? Do you think Joseph grieved when he was cast into prison? But he had a faith in God that was unshakable, and he fulfilled God's prophecies about his life, and he became second only to the Pharaoh. Do you think Job grieved, and yet God restored to him seven times over all that had been stolen from him. Listen to me this morning. Fear is bad. Grief is good. Grieve before the Lord, but always grieve in faith. Look at Psalms 23 and verse 4. Even when I walk through the darkest valley, and right now, just think of what the darkest valley might be through you. Maybe you've already been through it. Even when I walk through the darkest valley, I will not be afraid, for you are close beside me. Your rod and your staff protect and comfort me. You see the metaphor of the shepherd there? How that Jesus is walking with you. I read a fascinating sports adventure article this week. Do you know there are blind skiers in the Rocky Mountains? Do you know there are blind skiers in the apps? I mean, they cannot see. The world is dark to them. But there is someone that skis alongside of them down the mountains, 
and they tap their poles as they're skiing, or they give them guidance, and they're able to ski black diamonds, they're able to ski because they have a shepherd going with them. And you might feel like you're going blindly through life right now, but you have a shepherd, and his name is Jesus Christ, and his rod and his staff will comfort and protect you. Somebody ought to jump up and shout amen right now. That's what God does in our life. When I know God, I don't have to know all the answers in life. When I know him, I don't have to have all the answers. Number six, God will protect me. God will protect me. If I've learned anything in life, and those of you that are younger, just hear me. There's always going to be critics. There's always going to be nags. There's always going to be jerks. There's always going to be gossipers. But don't attack them back. Don't attack them back. There was something horrible that happened this week or last week in the church world. And all of a sudden, you may have seen it. People were jumping on and making all kinds of judgments and assumptions. My son happened to be at that meeting. One of my best friends happened to be at that meeting. Another official in our church was at that meeting, and they said all the stuff on the internet was just so far off base. If there's anything I don't trust, it's trolls on the internet and people that are trying to stir up trouble. Whether it's politics or religion or gossip, don't attack back. Society, look at me. I love you. And I love your children, so I want you to hear me. Society is losing its civilness. Society is forgetting how to be polite. Let God handle mean, rude people. Somebody said something a couple of years ago in our community about work that I do as a volunteer in our community. And it stung, it hurt. So I made a call and I offered to resign and they said, oh no. We knew the moment it was said it wasn't true. I said, how did you know that? He says, because we know you. Look at me. Your reputation will go before you. Don't cheapen your reputation by attacking people who want the attention that your attack would bring to them. Still, are you hearing me this morning? Don't cheapen and lose your reputation. Look at what the Bible says in Psalms 23 and verse 5. You prepare a feast for me in the presence of my enemies You honor me by anointing my head with oil. My cup overflows with blessings. Do you know what God is saying there? God's saying, I'm going to prepare, Todd, I'm going to prepare a table for you, and I'm going to anoint you, and I'm saying to the rest of the world and to all your enemies, this is my boy, back off. This is my kid, back off. This is my son, I'm honoring him. This is my daughter, I'm honoring her. Don't you love the Lord? God is always there. So three things here real quickly. Have confidence. Have confidence. Psalms 91.2, you are my place of safety and protection. Say it aloud to the Lord. Psalms 91 and verse 2, I will say to the Lord, you are my place of safety and protection. You are my God and I trust you. Let's read this together out loud right now. I will say to the Lord, you are my place of safety and protection. You are my God, and I trust you. Would you say it one more time? I will say to the Lord, you are my place of safety and protection. You are my God, I trust in you. And thirdly, God is watching over me. Psalms 91 verse 4. His huge outstretched arms protect you, and under them you're perfectly safe. His arms fend off all harm. And then finally this morning, don't you love that word when I say it? When I say, because you know when I say finally, I really am finally done. So finally, God will finish what he started in my life. God will finish. Just in some closing advice this morning before we pray. You can look at the future, you can look at life one of two ways. What if, or you can say, God, you will finish what you started in my life. 
What if the money runs out? What if my health fails? What if my kids backslide? What if my child is born disabled? You can come up with all the what ifs that you want. What if 71% of Americans are correct and our government is corrupt and dysfunctional? What if there is another nuclear war? What if there is another disease like COVID waiting for us around the corner? You can fill your mind with the doubts of what ifs. Or you can fill your mind with the faith that ends anxiety by saying, God will finish what he started in me. God will finish what he started in you. Say it with me. God will finish what he started in me. Faith is the end of anxiety. Say that with me. Faith is the end of anxiety. This week, I want you to confess this verse one morning. Surely, this is Psalms 23 and verse 6, surely your goodness and unfailing love will pursue me all the days of my life, and I will live in the house of the Lord forever. Until Jesus comes or I die, I can tell you what's over my shoulder. Goodness and mercy. Goodness and mercy. When I walk down this aisle this morning, goodness and mercy will be following me. When I walk out of this church this afternoon, goodness and mercy will be following me. When I eat fried chicken, all calories and all cholesterol will be cast out this afternoon because goodness and mercy are following me. When I go for a walk, goodness and mercy are following me and everyone I come in contact with, they're going to experience the goodness and mercy. And when I come in tonight to go to bed and I look at Becky and I go, va, 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 boom, goodness and mercy are going to follow me and I'm going to sleep like a baby. Somebody say, come on, victory today. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let it sink into your soul. Hallelujah. Goodness and mercy are following me. Look at your neighbor right now and say, goodness and mercy are following me. Goodness and mercy. Hallelujah. Stand to your feet with me this morning, and let's go to the Lord in prayer. Bow your heads. Lord, no one on this planet can meet my needs, not even my precious wife, Becky. But God, I do not want for anything because you are so good. The Lord provides all my needs. Father, this week, I hear your command to lie down and rest. So I'm going to obey that, Lord. And God, I'm not going to allow the internet or binge watching or anxiety to rob me of sleep. I'm going to lie down and rest because to your beloved, you give rest. Lord, I commit this week to filling my soul with beauty, whether it's in what I read or watch, how I garden, Lord, how I take care of what you've given me. I'm going to surround my soul with beauty. And Jesus, when I'm confused about the decisions I need to make, Lord, I'm going to you for guidance. And if I'm walking through a dark valley today, I make this my confession. You are my peace. You have broken down every wall. You have broken every chain. And like those blind skiers, you walk with me. And Lord, when I'm under attack, I'm going to simply do good. I'm not going to pay back evil with evil, but I'm going to do good and love my enemies. And I'm going to enjoy the feast, the banquet that you prepared for me. I'm going to lead you in that prayer now. And I want you to be extravagant with your faith. And just repeat after me. Say, Father, you meet all my needs. I can't hear you. Let's do it again. Father, you meet all my needs. Father, today I receive your gift of rest. Father, fill my soul with beauty. 
Father, I'm confused, so I'm coming to you for guidance. Jesus, you are my peace in the darkest valley. And when I'm attacked, I will return evil with good, and I will enjoy the feast. While every head is still bowed, all of these promises, these seven promises can be yours today by committing your life to Jesus Christ. He will give you a fresh start. He will forgive all your sins upon your confession of faith in Him. So right now, I'm just asking you to pray this prayer with me. Start this journey. It's a journey. God will show you what you need as you get established in your faith, as you grow in your faith, as you find a local church to worship with. I hope it'll be Woodland. But let's start with first things first. If we didn't need a Savior, Jesus would not have come and died for our sins. This is a big deal. So would you pray this prayer with me? Say, Heavenly Father, thank you for the gift of Jesus. As much as I know how, I confess my sins to you, and I place my trust in you, and I ask you to be my shepherd. For it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen, amen, and amen. And there'll be some information coming up on the screen, or for those of you here at the church, if anybody prayed with me this morning, we want to help you get established in that faith. I do love you. I mean that. I prayed for you. And for my friends that I invited, and I saw you online before I came up here, thank you for joining us at Woodland. God bless you. Come give Tony Toko a big hug around the neck. Tony, we love you. God bless you, and happy birthday. Amen. You're dismissed. <laughs>